on that question of UKIP, mm-hmm. what is the answer? Is the answer for Labor, is it what to go back to a more selective or restricted or restrained immigration policy? The answer, first of all, is not to demonise the UKIP voters. I've been to former mining villages that are voting UKIP. So it's to recognise, first of all, that there's an estrangement from the, let's say, the ancestors of the people who created the party. There's a feeling of dispossession, that the party's been taken away, that it's very uh, middle class, that our concerns are not their concerns. So there's a, there's a, a sense of loss so there there has to be a concerted respect for UKIP voters. Then there's issues about the control of assets that are very strong for Labour, that, the, that there's too much concentration of control in too few hands, and then uh, decentralisation of power to people. But moving on, um, certainly is to find allies in Europe to renegotiate this free movement, that so that's very important. These are fundamental issues of political economy. They're not about bigotry and England's a very open country people just wanted it to have a political discussion about how we build a common life with the people who are there and and that was proving difficult it's absolutely vital that people are able to name their pain to to Mm. say that this is causing me grief that's politics and then to try to stop building coalitions with other people to change it. Mm. It gets tricky though Morris because the other area where you got into trouble with you know, if you like, the intellectual elites, the liberal elites, was where you suggested at least communicating with the supporters of the English Defence League, which is a... I mean, you didn't... um, We're not talking about you sitting down with the skinheads, but I think you did at least want to understand what is the grievance behind this. This is about anti-fascist organising and goes back really goes back to the 20s. There were two strategies on the left. One was to demonise them. Mm. But what that does is is that that just increases the polarisation and increases their power. Or the other strategy is to divide them. Our first move mustn't be hatred and demonisation of people, but to try to engage and see if you can sort of engage their energy and their rage in more constructive ways, which has to be a common good. So we're always trying to bring immigrants together with locals um, mm-hmm. and see where that conversation goes. And it always goes in the same direction to let you know well, why don't we get together and try and sort out wages? This should be home territory for for Labour, issues relating to to housing. And then accountability. What people feel is they feel powerless. So people feel that they're just not heard. So the vital thing always is, you know, Saul Alinsky, who I love the community organiser, said that the definition of a Liberal was someone who walked out the room before the argument began. (laughs) You know, and and the real challenge to everybody (laughs) is stay in the room, hear what's going on. There's no saying it's going to work out, and often it doesn't. But when it does, it's magic. And when you get a genuine coalition going on between religious and secular locals and immigrants that's the common good so the common good is is difficult Mm. that's that's what i understand and kind of my life is i think a testament to that i mean your family were immigrants to the uk jewish immigrants to the uk let me ask you very directly though morris is britain now multicultural enough that it's it's got where it should be what I say is we haven't put enough emphasis on bringing people together. So there was a sort of official ideology of a sort of multiculturalism, which didn't stress um, bringing people together and working together to change their world. Um, what you find is particularly poor people, immigrants and locals, mm-hmm. have, have a shared dispossession in many ways. But there, there's very few places anymore where they can get together and work out a common life. And then once they start engaging in doing things together, relationship and friendships form. And that's the vital thing, which involves developing leaders from groups, immigrants and and local groups, that are not represented at the moment in in politics. Mm. You do make the point that pluralism and diversity can undermine the solidarity that's necessary for redistribution and the welfare state. Why is that? Well, if people don't feel that they share a fate with other people, so the building up of welfare and, and, mm. and solidarity is a political achievement, but we tended to start thinking of it as a set of legal entitlements. And that's just a mistake. It was a political, that was the achievement of the labour movement, that, they, that we would insure each other against destitution, we would insure each other in, in, um, in terms of health and in terms of providing a mutual home in the world. Now, that's an enormous imaginative leap to 
feel responsible and to share a fate and turn that fate into a shared destiny. Now, if you feel that you don't share the life of others, mm. then what you will get is, is a lack of support for the sacrifices required to do that. So the welfare state, which used to be a source of unity, has become a site of contestation. It is always a pleasure. Morris, thank you so much for being with us on the program. Thank you. <laughs>